Holmes, are you there? Are you sleeping? I'm thinking, Watson. Are you ever going to quit these four walls? If you continue to shut yourself away like this, I will have to abandon the story of your adventures and write an essay on the fascinating colour of this closed door. Very good, Watson. Stop ignoring me! Didn't you say that we need to assess the case of this madman? I, too, can be driven mad, Holmes. I'll order Mrs. Hudson to stop bringing you food. I'll get some straw and a can of lamp oil and smoke you out like a common fox. And if you still don't come out, I'll... As you wish, Watson. Oh, Holmes, I despair of you. Holmes's violin. Holmes examined the broken jar that belonged to Finley's tenant. I wonder what this substance is. I don't recognize the odor. Formalin, Watson. This jar contained formalin. Interesting, don't you think? Hmm. I've been waiting for something for days. Just the tiniest bit of news that would make sense of this whole matter. But there's nothing, neither from the press nor the police. Unless Inspector Abeline is holding on to some information without realizing its importance, which is quite possible. It is time for you to return to the police station in Whitechapel, Watson. And didn't you tell me that you had a matter to take care of it? Take advantage of it to learn more about this pill and its contents. Ah, but Holmes, it's late. And spending another night in this district is hardly my idea of entertainment. I know, Doctor, but we don't have any choice. Time is against us. Take your pistol in case you run into any troublesome characters. Fine, as you wish, Holmes. Good evening. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Not at all, Doctor. This man, Mr. Richardson, is a witness to the horrid affair at 29 Hanbury Street, the murder of Annie Chapman. We are discussing the relevance of his testimony. You're probably not in a position to discuss it with me, but I would like to know more about what you call the relevance of this young man's testimony. Oh, there's no secrecy. It's simply that the testimony given by Mr. Richardson doesn't match the time of death given by the coroner, Dr. Phillips. What was the time of death, according to him? Before half four in the morning. My conclusions were the same. Were there any other conflicting testimonies? Well, two other witnesses summoned at the preliminary inquest gave testimony, but in these cases too, the times don't match. Do you remember what it was they said? I didn't question them myself. A colleague of mine took down their statements on paper, but on deciding they were of little use, he tore them up and threw them in the bin. There's no point in being bogged down with useless paperwork. I will take my leave, Humphreys. Goodbye, Doctor. Here are the ripped statements. I can piece them together again. There, all done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. An old report on arrests that took place a few years earlier. Excuse me, Doctor, but I'm... Good 
evening, Mr. Solomonovich. Good evening, Doctor. What a pleasure to see you again. Have you finished converting the harnesses? Yes, just now. I got a little behind because of all the commotion. Commotion? Don't you start. Three days ago, the very afternoon that you passed by, there was a chase throughout the neighborhood. Hundreds of people were chasing a man, claiming he was responsible for the murders these last few days. Schmontz! It was awful! I hope those maniacs didn't catch him. Better the police should. Tell me, did John Pizer turn himself in to the police? Things unfolded as they should. Look in the newspaper, the daily news from today. Farewell, Isaac. Goodbye, Doctor. Good evening, Dr. Gibbons. Dr. Watson. Did you keep the cane we spoke of last time? I was going to sell it tomorrow, would you believe, having not heard word. Here are your harnesses, Doctor. They are top quality, I'd say. Definitely worth the prize of this walking stick. Here, it's yours. Do you have any formalin here? No, definitely not. They have it in university hospitals to conserve anatomical specimens in jars. But in a little clinic like mine, we don't keep anything but bad memories. Hmm, there is a strong smell of gas. It seems to be coming from the abandoned building. Good evening, Finlay. How are you? Oh, good evening, Doctor. So-so. And you? It smells of gas here. Ah, you might say, Doctor. Without wanting to speak ill of the force, I have to wonder if the police are up to something. What do you mean? Well, I was outside yesterday evening when the light went out of my place, and a gas smell came from the abandoned building across from my place. And a minute later, the police arrived and were snooping all around like it was them who hit the gas before arriving. Have things sorted themselves out with your strange tenant? Don't talk about it, Doctor. That man is truly bizarre. He goes to the most sordid locations once night falls. Three days ago, my wife told me she saw him come in with blood-stained clothes and a fearsome look. Interesting. What does he look like and how old is he? Oh, he's my age, give or take, so the other side of 50. He's always dressed in a striking manner with an American hat. He's big, close to 5'11", I'd say. He has a strange voice, not just his accent, see, his voice. Very well. Goodbye for now, Finley. Goodbye, Doctor. Now then, let's go to the police station. Excuse me, Doctor, but I must take Mr. Richardson's statement. May I introduce myself? I'm Dr. Watson. I am... You want to be the chap what writes the detective stories in that there paper? Well, yes, indeed, my stories have been published in the Strand. Go oh, blimey, wanna tell me, old mum? It would seem your testimony is the subject of some debate. Could you tell me what it was about? Ah, uh, they'll be telling I'm a bit befuddled about the times that I told them. But it can't be so. I knows what I sees and what I don't sees that morning. What did you see, or what didn't you see? And at what time, would you say? 
I'll tell you this for nothing. It's me old mum who lives at the house where the body was found out back in the garden. She has her shop at the bottom to the right of the stairs. Her door was broken down not too far back because it's a real zoo it is. Right, the morning it happened, I head that way to see if me old mum has finally had the place broken into. It was quarter five when I got there. That I'll swear on me dear old mum's life. I had a look round to see if the cellar had been taken. No. I had a little sit down on the stairs by the courtyard because me shoes were causing me no end of pain and I had a cut and all. I didn't see a single thing below the steps, Doctor. Not one single thing. If there was some bird all covered in blood, taint no how I could have missed that, even if it were night time. Right. Five minutes after getting to number 29, I had to clip off. And now they tells me that either I can't tell time no more, or I was fixing me loafer next to a stiff that was still steaming. All right then. Evening, gents. Yes, Doctor? So, how far along are the investigations into these two recent murders? Everyone around here believes both crimes were committed by the same man. But as for the Hanbury Street and Bucks Row crimes, nobody has heard or seen a thing. By the way, have you heard of a Dr. Tumblety? Um, no. Is it important? Yes. Well, no, maybe. Actually, I don't know. I have heard about this man, his frequent nocturnal outings and bizarre behaviour. What does this chap look like, Doctor? And where can we find him? The last I heard was that he was staying at Finley's place, the man who was looking for me a few days ago. It would greatly assist us if you could ask Finley what your strange associate looks like. We could then see if the description matches any witness accounts. Tumblety is a man around 5 foot 11, about 55 years old, extravagantly dressed and with a rather distinctive voice. He boards at Finley's. You should know where that is, as the police were there only yesterday. Their arrival coincided with a strange gas leak. Ah, yes, I know where you mean. Indeed, there was an odd affair with the gas. It was rather unsettling. We were searching for a well-known scoundrel who was ratted out by Squibby, the chap we followed and saved from the pack a few days ago. This thug, no pity Bluto, must have been in the abandoned building in question. But there was no sign of him when we arrived. Furthermore, an inspector said that, given the smell, the thingamabob that supplies gas to the building was probably damaged. So we took no risks and were called away somewhere else. I will take my leave, Humphreys. Goodbye, Doctor. Well, farewell, Doctor. Goodbye, Doctor Watson. I must go to Miss Bellows. Good evening, ma'am. Um, your door was open. Isn't that a little dangerous? Hello, Doctor. Don't worry, if the looks of anyone who enters doesn't please me, me and my pistol know how to convince them to leave. Do you happen to know Annie Chapman, the poor woman who was killed three days ago? Dark Annie? Pfft. Like all the drifters in the area, I've seen her once or twice. With respect to the dead, Annie really was the bottom of the barrel. What do you mean? Well, in our profession, the pretty young ones go out when night has barely fallen and don't have a problem finding takers. But poor girls like Annie or Polly Nichols, who aren't as tender and are often sick, sometimes trudge around for a whole night in the cold and the rain before landing a client. And that doesn't help their appearances either. They don't have much choice about paying for a bed for a few hours, a glass of gin or a hot meal. How terribly sad. <sighs> That's the price of survival in Whitechapel, my angel. One of my girls knew Annie for some time. They bought some jewellery on the black market, I think. Jewellery? 
How could Annie Chapman have possibly afforded jewellery? <laughs> Luxuries for a woman are always relative to her condition, Doctor. As a matter of fact, it was real cheap junk. Annie got three assorted brass rings, I think. <laughs> it's been said I have a memory for jewellery. How is Lucy keeping? She's doing well, Doctor. But believe me, it won't last. Rare are the girls who can build a future in our profession. Very well. I shall let you get back to work, Ma. See you soon, my love. You're still there, Doctor. I found the cane that was stolen from your client. Here it is. Doctor, you are a real saint, I can see that. I'll finally be able to present my bill to this damned painter. If by chance you see him, tell him that a little surprise awaits him here. You told me you would give me some information on this Dr. Tumblety. Agreed. He's a Canadian or an American. He parades from time to time through the neighborhood in a 50 guinea suit and acts like a doctor. But for business, he isn't worth it. This damn Yankee hates women. The few times that he was approached by the girls, he spit on them, all the while hurling insults. It would seem that he was hunting for the bad boys. He's looking for trouble, that animal. Does he frequent any pub in particular? Aye, the Wasp's Nest on Burner Street, I think. A seedy spot even by our standards. Very well, I shall let you get back to work, Ma. See you soon, my love. <laughs> The Wasp's Nest. This pub looks even more disreputable than the Golden Lion in Baker Street. Greetings, my good man. Could I have a pint? Here, Gov. I've been told that Dr. Tumblety might be found around here. Is that so? I don't do a roll call of all the drunkards here. I've got my hands full just making sure I get their money. Don't people pay when they order? Nah, look at that little scribbler there. Completely dead drunk. Tonight's tally is about as long as his arm. If he skips out, I'll be in for a guinea almost. Goodbye, my friend. Oi, that's it. Good evening, sir. Well, I know you. Why? We met at Miss Poolman's the other day. So you've come to slum it in Whitechapel, eh? You know Dr. Tumblety, a Canadian or American chap, quite an extravagant dresser. Frequents this pub now and then. Are you intimate? Um, no. What do you mean by that? 
Oh, nothing, nothing at all. I just wanted to prove my discretion concerning this man, in so much and so far as I know him. You wouldn't like it if one day the tables were turned and everyone was talking about why you were in the borough, isn't that so? As it happens, I saw Miss Pullman recently. She told me that she couldn't wait to see you again. She said something about a surprise that is waiting for you at her establishment. Why, that is some of the best news I've heard, my friend. As thanks, I would like to let you in on a secret. The man that you were talking about, and whom I happen to know by sight, passed by and went through that little door that you see over there. Another man let him in. They weren't together for more than a few minutes, to be sure, eh? Well, I will continue my search. Ah, uh, love. But what is this person trying to imply? <sighs> this matter is beyond me. Good evening, sir. It'll be the coup of my career, Governor said. Ha! <laughs> You'll make loads of dust of the paper, he said. You're a journalist? That's so. Tom Bulling at your service. <laughs> the Whitechapel ferret. The wizard with the scoop. You don't appear to be in a state to write anything, my friend. You're mistaken. Whiskey passes through the blood and turns into ink. Simple. <laughs> you see, mugs and inkwells are all the same. Don't you think you should settle your tab and go home? My red ink? Where's my red ink? I won't even pay half a halfpenny if they don't return my red ink. It's my blood you hear. Very well. I'll be on my way. <coughs> hey, you can't go in there. It's private. Got it? Oi, what'll it be to drink, Gav? could return to Baker Street, but I am still missing some information. And that would put Holmes in a devil of a mood. Could you tell me what type of pill this is? Yes, we have those here. It's not really a medication. We give them to patients with chronic respiratory conditions like tuberculosis. Did you have a patient by the name of Annie Chapman? The woman killed three days ago. Indeed. She came in the morning of her death. Poor woman. Did you give her these pills? Yes, now that I think of it. She actually came in twice. The first time I gave her an almost empty container without making her pay. She came back during the day and said she dropped the container and stepped on the pills. She wanted to know if I could give her more again without paying. I refused. After she left, a patient who was there told me that he lives at the same place and confided that she had been lying. He saw the pills fall in the tenement's communal kitchen, but the woman immediately wrapped them up in a piece of paper. Where did this paper come from? According to this man, she'd found it near the chimney in the kitchen. Anyone could have thrown that paper there. That envelope can't have anything to do with the murder. Pardon, Doctor? Uh, nothing. I was just talking to myself. Well, farewell, Doctor. Goodbye, Dr. Watson. This is the sink where the barmaid puts the glasses to soak. Look, red ink. What's that doing here? The bottle is closed, 
There must still be some ink inside, and it looks like a glass. The barmaid must have put ink into the sink by mistake. Right. Do I get in your way? Me? If you'll excuse me, sir. You're the best. The boss told me. My red ink. Well, where she be? I found your red ink, my friend. You should settle up and head home. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. The spring-heeled phantom will be revived. Gav? Here you go. It's on the journalist, my friend. I owe you one. The next one is on me. What'll it be? Nothing, thanks. But I may need your help. Listen, my friend. I would like you to let me in the door over there. You're a bobby. A peeler? Absolutely not, my friend. I am a doctor. Fine. I owe you this, at least. There's a bloke behind that door there. No pity, Bluto. Let's just say he wants to lay low for a moment. So I don't think you'll be opening the door just now. Unless... Tell him you have word from Squibby. That'll open the door. But who can say what'll happen when the door closes? Goodbye, my friend. Oi! That's it! Let me in. I... I have news from Squibby. But stay calm. And who are you? Where's Squibby? He's out. To be honest, I don't actually know this Squibby chap. I was actually wondering if you knew Dr. Tumblety. A Canadian or American fellow. He came in... Sure we know him. Excellent. Can you... You know about gas? I'm afraid not. I am a doctor. Then I ain't interested. You can be leaving now. But if I find out who snitched to the peelers, I'll find you. Got it? But I can pay you for... Keep your coins for the paupers. Or one of the gas boys who ain't afraid of nothing and knows how to hold his tongue. You bring him to me. I'll meet with you. Well, it would seem that I have all the information I need for my investigation. Anyway, this fellow Bluto at the Wasp's Nest is rather shady and doesn't look like he'll want to cooperate. I'd be better off returning to Baker Street. Holmes will certainly know what to do. And besides, I am worn out. Let's go back to Baker Street. Home sweet home. There we are, Holmes. I've told you in great detail everything that happened last night. Excellent work, Watson. We shall now be prepared to answer a few questions about the horrible murder in Hanbury Street. Do you think we are now in a position to find out the identity of the murderer of these two women? No, I don't think so. It's outside of our scope and not our responsibility. As much as you've done for Leather Apron and the affair with the pills, our mission is to help the police by ensuring that they don't get caught up following false leads and to point them in the right direction. Let us start from what we know with some certitude. As you have just said, it is almost certain that the same person killed the Bucks Row and Hanbury Street victims. The reason to assume as much are numerous and I shan't elaborate here. What do these two victims have in common? It's true these two women were in the same profession, but... Indeed, Watson. These two women were both prostitutes. That is of vital importance, Watson. My memory from your examination of the scene is rather hazy. Didn't you say something about the killer's frame of mind? I was talking about the victim's possessions that were placed on the ground and the rings missing from Annie Chapman's fingers. This killer is a cunning predator, comes from a rather humble background and shows steely self-control in carrying out the murders. Something is puzzling me, Holmes. Richardson's testimony contradicts the time of death given by Dr. Phillips, which also matches my own, 4.30 a.m. 
And yes, we shall confirm that, Watson, and attempt to determine the precise time of death. In order to do that, we will need to place everyone involved on a timeline. Only after that will we be able to place the knife symbolizing our killer. Let's look at our timeline, Watson. Let's put the time of death as assessed by Dr. Phillips. The assessment of the time of the murder given by Dr. Phillips and yourself, Watson, 4.30 a.m. We left the station at 6 o'clock and it took us 20 minutes to arrive at Hanbury Street. Our arrival at the scene occurred at around 6.20. Given the distance separating the two locations, we can deduce that the corpse wasn't discovered after 6 o'clock and therefore that the murder must have been committed before. Now, for the most important part, the testimony of Miss Long. She claims to have seen a woman speaking to a man near 29 Hanbury Street sometime around... What time, Watson? Let us assume, therefore, that Miss Long's testimony is, as is most certainly the case, true. She places her meeting with the victim at around 5.30, claiming to have heard a clock chime on the half hour at the moment when she enters the street. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. 
Despite the great respect I have for Dr. Phillips and the value I place on our friendship, my deepest conviction is that both of you are mistaken and that Richardson is in the right and that these two testimonies put down in writing have real worth. But how? Explain yourself, Holmes. Remember how you assessed the time of death? You touched the fingers and body of the victim, but it was remarkably cold for this time of year. In addition, the corpse had been drained of bodily fluids. Its heat retention was therefore no longer the same as that of an intact corpse. Egad! You're right, Holmes. Oh, I've had some time to research, Watson. Given these facts, my first diagnosis may have been off by half an hour, perhaps even an hour. Thus, we can confirm Richardson's statement and establish that the murder was committed after 4.50 a.m. and not before 4.30 a.m. Our next witness is Albert Kadosh. Albert Kadosh goes down into his garden at approximately 5.20 and on re-entering his home, hears voices in number 29's garden. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh goes back down into his garden approximately four minutes after having left it and hears the sound of an impact against the wooden fence. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh leaves the garden, enters his house, then leaves for work, seeing the clock on the Spitalfields church showing 5.32. Excellent, Watson. All our people are now in place. Yes, but Holmes, Miss Long, claims to have seen the victim at around 5.30. But according to Kadosh, someone, most certainly the victim and her murderer, was already in the garden at 5.30. Excellent observation, Watson. It must be noted, however, that these two witnesses, Long and Kadosh, saw the time shown on the clocks in the area, which are often inaccurate and went by their empirical and, in this case, erroneous estimate of how much time had passed. Thus, neither of these two times can be considered reliable. Do you mean to say that these two testimonies might match? Indeed. Let's put Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30. Let's add Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30 a.m. Mr. Kadosh claims to have passed by the Spitalfields Church at 5.32, which given the distance from 27 Hanbury Street would mean he was still at home at 5.31. Let's therefore put the end of his testimony at 5.31. Miss Long heard the man say to the victim, Will you... To which the victim responded, Yes, which would suggest that an agreement was reached and that the transaction was imminent. They then proceeded to enter the garden, which puts the voices heard by Kadosh at 5.29. We had thought that Kadosh had left 27 Hanbury Street at 5.31 after having heard an impact against the fence. 
Thus, two minutes passed between the moment when Kadosh entered the house after having been in the garden the first time and the moment when he returns to go out again and leave for work. How long did he estimate this interval to be? Three to four minutes. In light of all this, Watson, we can finally establish the time of Chapman's murder. Now, place the knife at the exact time. Now then, taking into account that the local clock isn't exact and that a young man was off by a minute or two in his estimations of his comings and goings, we can confirm Miss Long's testimony and place the time of the crime at approximately 5.30. But in that case, Holmes, the man that Miss Long saw is none other than... That's right, Watson. It was the Whitechapel killer. To think that Miss Long and Kadosh were only a few feet away from him. Indeed, Watson, had Miss Long passed just a little closer to the victim and her assassin, or had the young Kadosh popped his head over the fence out of curiosity, the killer would most certainly already be behind bars. That's some stroke of luck he had there. I couldn't agree more, Watson, but his luck didn't end there, given the mutilations inflicted upon this poor woman. What must be considered, above all, is the killer's obvious wish to remove one and only one specific organ. His surgery pinpointed the exact spot, avoiding superfluous incisions. This suggests the man possesses at least a minimal anatomical knowledge. Are you suggesting a, a doctor or a butcher? Perhaps, but the possibilities are still too broad to conclude with any certainty. Now for the motive. Despite my almost complete lack of practical experience on the subject, I have a rather precise idea of the usefulness of a uterus and a vagina. Nonetheless, once they are separated from their usual envelope, I am more circumspect as to the uses one can make of them. What do you think, Watson? We need a board, Watson. Money, quite simply. Even if this motive seems incongruous, we're in no position to deny or affirm it until we know whether a market for human organs exists. Holmes, what if it was cannibalism? Even if the idea is unbearable, uh, we can't ignore it as a possibility. Perhaps it was intended as a study specimen. I have little faith in that theory. Hardly anything was taken from the Bucks Row victim. Black magic? Watson, this line of investigation is far too vague. We don't have a single clue in support of such a motive. We can eliminate this hypothesis. A desire for some sort of morbid trophy. I'd be inclined to dismiss this motive. If this were the case, why would nothing have been removed from the Bucks Row victim? Elementary. What emerges from these possible motives for having removed the uterus from the second victim is that they implied that the killer could have carried out the same thing on the Bucks Row victim, yet didn't. This brings us to a terrible conclusion. Our killer has evolved in the space of only a few days, and if that's the case, had he already struck before the first murder to which we attribute him? And if the killer strikes again, what atrocity awaits his next victim? We have to stop him, Holmes. 
We shall do our best. This recent business of jar filled with formalin and of the American doctor might be a lead. Watson, inquire among medical circles to ascertain if there is a black market for human organs. The chances are slim, but this must be pursued. Very well. What about you, Holmes? I will send word to Inspector Abilene regarding our recent conclusions. I should also like to become a gas man and pay a visit to Bluto at the Wasp's Nest. Understood, Holmes. I think one of my old university colleagues who works at the London Hospital will be able to help me. I shall write him a note at once. He should be able to see me during the day. Afterwards, shall we meet here? Yes, Watson. See you later, and good luck. I must get to the London Hospital, where my old university colleague works.